welcome. And, and I hope that this information that I'm about to uh, dispense as best I can uh, is of some help to you. This information is mostly, and it is rather, rather pointedly for the voice actors inside United States of America. And even if you're just getting started and you're looking for the, the right foot to put forward as your first step or a few setup steps, um, getting started early in, in, in a way that's, that you're aware of the finances and taxes uh, and work it to your advantage. Really, that's really that's all I'm. That's all I'm trying to do here this evening, uh, so that you can take a look at your business model and indeed uh, make it efficient. Because after all, we are indeed every one of us running a business, and I'm sure that is a, an advice that you've heard at some point in your career, your journey so far. We are indeed running a business. And all I'm doing is merely bringing awareness and information from the stuff that I've learned over the years and the trials and tribulations that I've had to go through, if you will, to help as best I can. And with that said, I am not an accountant. I am not an accountant. I, my major is not in finances in any way. I did not study any tax codes. And what I'm about to tell you in the next uh, hours to come uh, should not be, should never be taken straightforward as uh, financial or tax related advice. This is simply information uh, from my own perspective and my own research and my own information gathering, trials and tribulations. Uh, that ho that hopefully you'll learn something from. Uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll bring to your CPA, or maybe you'll be better prepared to go to whatever tax prep software that you use to 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 make it make it count the most, if you will. I read somewhere in the early phases of my career and of my research about voiceover that having an LLC was beneficial for voice acting, so I established one. In 2017, one year after, should I, would I have done the same thing now? No. Stuff like this is why I'm here. <laughs> and, and I learned a lot, if you will, and went through a lot. And, and again, what follows is simply a series of instructions, advice, personal, not financial, not tax, qualified advice, personal suggestions from my own experience. The majority of this lecture will be about taxes, and I think finances, to a degree, we understand um, the idea of expenses and profit, uh, net and gross, um, how, to, how to manage our money, all the things, and these things are not necessarily voice acting or entrepreneurship-based uh, information. It's stuff that you should know by now as an adult. Don't spend more than what you owe. Pay back your debts and you got to pay taxes and set money aside. Da, 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 right? So the majority, the, the bigger chunk of this lecture will be about the taxes. Uh, again, applicable to the freelancers, the voice actors in the U.S. Voice actors in the U.S. are hired in one of two ways. And those two are either as an employee or as what's called an independent contractor. And, and this part is more about understanding uh, what can be expected of you as the actor who is being hired for this thing. Yeah? Um, as an employee, if you've had a job, you understand how this works. You work, there's a wage or a salary, right? And when you get paid on your payday, you look at your check and there are things taken out of it. Taxes, the federal taxes, the state taxes, that if that's applicable, uh, all the things that they, they take out of your paycheck. And then what you get is indeed your pay, right? And voice actors can be hired in the same way as an employee. And when you receive the check or the payments, uh, the statement or the stub, either digitally or in your inboxes, it'll also list the stuff that's been taken out of your check, right? Just like a regular job. And should you be hired as an employee, the clients will often ask for a W-4. A W-4, a document that says, this is who I am, this is my social security number, and here are the exemptions that I can claim as a, as a, a person who pays taxes in this country, right? Um, essentially, you're telling the employer to take out this much taxes out of your pay. That's what a W-4 is for. 
you know how to do this, hopefully. Um, but because we're also voice actors and they want to, they don't know you, right? They also want to make sure that you are indeed eligible to work in the in the country. So they'll ask for an I nine or a DE four if you're in California. Uh, it determines your eligibility to work. Uh, your social does that. So some places won't ask for I nine or DE four, but some some places have to have a better uh, compliance about paperwork and verification of their employees. So. Uh, it's not unusual, is what I'm trying to say, as a voice actor. If you get hired as an employee, it's not unusual for them to go, please give us a W-4, please give us an I-9, and if you're in California, please give us a DE-4, right? Uh, they're not trying to get into your finances and hack into your whatever. These are the forms that they'll, they'll require to make sure that you are indeed verified uh, and eligible to work as an employee in the United States, in California for DE-4. Right, so that part is pretty easy, and you work from January to December, and the following year, sometime before uh, April fifteenth, the tax day, hopefully long before, right? Uh, you get this thing in the mail that says, uh, "Here's a here's your W two, which basically says from your employer, this is how much we paid you, and this is how much tax we took out of your paycheck, and because." Because uh, uh, union jobs, right? Union jobs are classified as an employer slash employee relationship. Union jobs, hundred percent, work in this manner. You are indeed an employer, employee, and you will submit a W four, and they will bring, they will send you send out a W two at the end of the year for union jobs you've done. Under the signatories that you work through, if that makes sense. But, well, there's some some non-union, some of them. It's super duper rare. Some non-union clients will hire you as an employee, but it's like extremely rare. Re once it happened to me once. I've been doing this eight years. Once they hired me as an employee status. Once, so it's ex in my opinion, extremely rare. Uh, everybody else, everybody else works as an independent contractor. You're not an employee who is entitled to the things that are afforded to employees. Instead, <clears throat> as a, as a, as a non-union actor, mostly, and some union stuff, non-employed, non-union production and things of this nature, you work as an independent contractor. Simply a partnership. They, they'll hire you, but without titling or labeling you as an employee, which has legal consequences. Right? So independent contractor. Um, when you're an independent contractor, taxes are not typically... 99.9% .9 of the time, 99 point, there are some that'll do that for you, even though you're a non-union, even though you're an independent contractor. That's happened once for me as well. So 99.9%. .9 taxes are not taken out of your pay when you get paid. So you book this thing, this video game, uh, that pays two fifty an hour with a two-hour minimum, so you show up and do the work, and everybody's happy, and the things are made, and they pay you. You're going to receive $500, as promised, right? Um, and because, because they need to know who you are, because <laughs> you're not an employee, just like a W-4, they will require a W-9 from you, which says the same thing as a W-4, kind of, without the, without the instructions telling the employer how much taxes to withhold, because they don't have to. They don't have to. Simply a W-9 says, this is who I am, here's my name, here's my address, that are legally government-named, da 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 my social, or EIN, we'll talk about that. And this is who I am as an identification. So when a, a company, when a studio, when a client asks for a W-9, it is normal. Some will ask for an I-9, DE-4 if you're California. Some will ask for, for eligibility. Some won't. And this one, this one varies uh, depending on their compliance on their end, obviously. And instead of a W-2, as you would receive as an employee, you'll receive a 1099 NEC. 
that any C stands for non employment compensation, as in the money they we paid you uh, to you who is not an employee. The legal language really becomes this thing where employee cannot be used. You'll receive that at the end of the year from that from that client that says, this is how much we paid you. So the process is the same. You submit a W-4 for your union job and you get a W-2 at the end of the year. And as a non-union, as an independent contractor, you submit a W-9 at the start of the job and you receive a 1099 NEC at the end to as, as a summary, as an as a annual thing. The United States tax code says that you don't have to uh, send the 1099 NEC if you paid a certain independent contractor less than $600. So uh, uh, say I hired you as an indep independent contractor uh, for this job, this acting thing, $250 an hour, two-hour minimum, $500. And that was the only time that we worked together in that one calendar year, right? The only time. And I paid you $500 in total. I don't have to send you a 1099 NEC. Should you still say to the government that I made five hundred dollars? Yes, you do. But the the idea of sending out a ten ninety nine NEC only applies for anything that they paid you six hundred dollars or more. Five ninety nine point ninety nine and below, you might not get a ten ninety nine NEC. Sure enough, that one uh, visual novel that you worked on that paid you fifty cents per word, whatever the rate might have been and the final compensation came out to $127 for this thing, they didn't send you a 1099 NEC because they don't have to. It's under 600 bucks, right? So anything under $600 is not worth it for the IRS to go after, to spend their time and money and effort and energy into. A lot of non-union, pretty much all of non-union jobs are contracted this way through independent contractor. And that's voice acting, artists, uh, graphic design, translation, all those, all the freelancer things, because we're freelancers, right? Businesses interacting with businesses in this way. So, unless you received six hundred bucks or more in payment, you don't have to worry about any of this. Should you still report it, keep track of it, and report it in your taxes? Yes, you do, of course. But don't expect your clients to send you a ten ninety nine if you made less than six hundred bucks. In the case of VO work that was performed as an employee, assuming you filled out the W-4 correctly, the employer will have withheld the proper amount of taxes and paid them on your behalf. Therefore, it is their responsibility as the employers to pay the taxes on your behalf. And should you had uh, filled out the W-4 in such a way that they held more than what you owe typically, Right? Um, you told them to hold additional hundred dollars of every check, so they held back more than than what what they're supposed to. At the end of the year, you get a tax refund. Right? This is how tax refunds happen. They hold back more than what you're entitled to, what you're liable to, perhaps, uh, on a, in a bigger concept, if you will. If you had, if you, if most of your work was as an independent contractor, they did not hold back your taxes. Therefore, you are responsible in paying those taxes. You are. They're not going to hold it back and, and pay it for you on your behalf. You have to be the one who does it. What taxes? Since I would imagine for so many voice actors, who, who, who are not in the union, who is not simply a, a solely working union jobs, right? Uh, most of the voice actors, myself included, will be working on a non-union aspect, I would imagine. And because we have to pay our own taxes, it might be a good idea to be aware of what they are. Yes? Four of them. The self-employment tax, the federal income tax, the state income tax, optionally and local income tax optionally. Let's talk about these. Um, everybody is on a self-employed owner of your own business. You are indeed an entrepreneur. Uh, and because you're an entrepreneur, uh, um, you are indeed in charge of your business, including paying the taxes that you're supposed to pay. Uh, here's the first thing, self-employment tax is paid just as the traditionally employed people do. Now, obviously, if you're an employee, you're not going to pay self-employment tax because you're employed by a company, 
right? But the thing that you pay, which is social security and Medicare, is exactly the same. So if you're an employee, employee of a of a job, right, or you get hired as an employee, you will pay this 15.3% tax on all the money that you make. Indeed, you'll see these on your on your pay stub. If you're an independent contractor, you are also pay owed, you have to pay the Social Security and Medicare into the system. It's just, it's just called self-employment tax, right? Uh, since the employers are not holding it back on your behalf, you have to pay it. 15.3% Social Security, Medicare. Makes sense, yes? This is pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Everybody pays this across the board. Second, federal income tax. This... This is the important one. Everybody pays this, of course. Um, you will first have to determine which filing status you fall under. Um, I'm married, happily, love my wife, and we both work. So uh, for my wife and I, we go fi a married filing jointly. That's how we do it. Some people will do married filing separately because they have their reasons. Uh, some people will do the head of household because they have their reasons and qualify for those things that they bring. But I would imagine many, 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 many of you uh, would be filing under single because you are, right? Um, for those who are not married, if you will. So let's say for the time being uh, uh, that we go on, suppose the following scenario under the single filing status of you. Um, but should you have, should, are you, if you're married and you're filing jointly, there are additional benefits and other addi additional quirky things that are written into that tax code that brings you benefit, like tax, a child tax credit, things of these nature, right? That'll help you, which we'll talk about down the road here. But, uh, if you're a single person, cause you are, you'll file under a single filing status. Let's suppose for this one, again, the numbers will differ. And the, the uh, qualifications will differ, and the benefits will differ from category to category, obviously. But uh, for the time being, because we don't, we don't have the time, rest of the, the time to talk about every single one, let's just focus on the single. Um, here is a bunch of numbers. <laughs> let it just, just, just let it hit you. It's okay. Right? Wow. Um, first, let's determine which tax bracket you're in. If you remember, it's it's like late October now, and so may, and and maybe you have a firm grasp uh, about like your finances and what you've made so far, and you know like where you fall in these in these brackets currently in the year twenty twenty four. But when you filed for twenty twenty three taxes earlier this year, um, there was a number, right? How much money you've made? There was a number. And that final taxable income, the total taxable income, falls into one of these categories federally for everybody in the United States. Can you imagine making 609351 or more in voice acting? My goodness. All right. So these are the numbers. And, and you can kind of tell where you fall, right? And let's, let's move on. I'll bring these, I'll bring these back. Let's be optimistic. Right? Let's be optimistic. And let's say that you had a very good year. Like a wonderful, awesome year. And you ended up making $80,000 in taxable income in your voice acting journey. And maybe it's a, a, a combination of things. You voice acted. You directed. You, you made acoustic panels and you sold them you did coaching you consulted for as a language expert for these things i don't know maybe you did stuff and all of that amounted to this year eighty thousand dollars hooray right uh if you're eighty thousand dollars that means you are liable for these things these brackets these numbers i want you to take a look at this very carefully Uh, this graph, this this horribly made graph, I apologize, uh, represents zero all the way up to the hundred thousand uh, five twenty five of that twenty two percent bracket I was referring to earlier, from zero to to that bracket. 
And if we made $80,000, the dotted line at the top there, that's how much taxes, that's how much tax you're liable for. And essentially, you pay the 10% of 11,600. Go uh, start from the bottom and go up with me, right? $80,000 obviously exceeds 11,600, right? So you are indeed responsible for 10% of 11,600, which is $1,160. And 47,150, again, you surpass that, right? So in the next bracket up, you pay 12% of 35,550, which is the difference between 47,150 and 11,600, 11, right? That second bracket there, 12% of that, which is 4,266. And between 47,150, 200,525, 80,000 is where you fall, right? So you pay 22% of that portion from 47,150 to 80,000, which is 32,850, and 22% of that is $7,227. Okay. <laughs> Again, start from the bottom with me, right? You exceed the first bracket, you exceed the second bracket, and you land in the top, top end of the third bracket, right? And you pay the 10% of the first bracket, 12% of the second bracket, and 22% of the, of, of the amount that you land on the third bracket, if that makes sense. Right? So, uh, uh, indeed, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be 22% of the 80000 It's how much money that you've made for in, inside that bracket that you're responsible for. And the 22% of 32850 2000, $7,227. Which all, all over comes to 12,000, if you add up these amounts, 12,653. Uh, and that number becomes your effective tax rate. Effective tax, tax rate. Which comes out to, in this example, in this example, which comes out to 15.8%. So if I'm, if I'm making. $80,000 a year as a voice actor in the U.S., federally speaking, I know that I am taxed at 15.8% at the federal level, right? How much taxes do you pay? How much should I withhold 15.8%, right? So... Information awareness, which we'll, we'll put these into practical terms and, and in, into, into, into like impl implementable advice down the line in this lecture. But this is how you figure out how much tax you're paying, federally speaking. It's not the total. It's not the total because there's the self-employment tax we talked about earlier, 15.3, right? And this on top. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Right. So, uh, continuing with the example and the idea of $80,000. Um, so you owe $12,653. You're liable for uh, that tax amount that you have to pay. Um, one way to do it is to just put down one huge single sum of dollars Sometime in January, I guess, uh, um, and and be done with it. I don't do that. Don't do. That. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. Don't do that. Better option, and and the option that they requ require you to do, right? They ask you. They they re require you to do, is quarterly estimated payments. Four times a year. Four times a year, you'll pay the 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 taxes instead of instead of your employer your your employer holding each amount month to month to month for you you take the initiative you take the action of paying the tax in advance four times a year april 15 june 15 september 15 and january 15 of the next calendar year four times a year Estimated, and and in, it is indeed estimated because I don't know, I don't know if I'm gonna make eighty thousand dollars flat. There's no way to know the future, 
right? Especially as a as a as a voice actor, do you know you're gonna get cast in that thing? You don't, right? So because we don't, we have to make estimated, educated guess based estimated tax payments uh, to be flexible, to be malleable, so that we don't overpay. And also be so that we don't underpay, because that'd be a bad thing, indeed. A mistake that I've made. Thank you very much, right? So, four times a year, as a voice actor who's making $600 or more, right? This year, in 2024, if you've made 600 bucks or more, you should have been paying. It's October now. You should have already paid three uh, uh, estimated payments quarterly. <laughs> oh, crap! It's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's all right. Um, how do you know? How do you know, right? Uh, uh, do you think that next year's uh, numbers, as an entrepreneur, as a voice actor, right? Um, if you've been doing this a number of years, you have an idea of the trajectory that you've experienced so far. Do you think next year you'll have a drastically different payment job, the thing that you may receive? I don't know, right? I don't know. Well, let's say it's a no. Like, you may maybe recently you got picked up by an agent. Uh, the, the big bi coastal large names that we know, and there's a possibility that your income might skyrocket because of all the all the uh, 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 opportunities you have access to. Your your in, your taxable income may change drastically next year. Who know? We don't know, right? Um, but if you know, kind of, that it won't have a drastic difference, then you can plan for that. Right? You could totally plan for it. So you could reasonably, I could reasonably hold 31.1% of every dollar I make that's federal tax plus the self employment tax that I know I have to pay. Right? Every time I get paid, I could withhold that somewhere else. Just as an employer will withhold it from me, I'll withhold it myself. Right? Four times a year. And then and I'll pay those out four times a year. And maybe, maybe at the end of the calendar year, you come out in January of next year and you go, I made a little bit below 80000 right? But I paid with the idea of 80000 in my mind, you're going to get a refund, right? Maybe you made a little more than 80000 right? Then I might owe some money. Estimated. <laughs> Estimated. And and maybe this big job that you worked on that puts you over that 80000 in the third quarter in July somewhere, right? And in that in that third payment, in the quarterly, four times a year, in that third payment, you know you made that huge job and made a bunch of money. And in that estimated payment, you'll pay a lot more, right? So that at the end of the year, there's no surprises. Please do quarterly tax payments. <laughs> Right, refund. So if you, if you if you paid more, um, what 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 about what about instead of withholding thirty one point one percent? What if you just held thirty four, a nice flat number thirty five forty? I don't know. You decide, right? Uh, something that's a little bit bigger, a little bit larger than the calculated amount of thirty one point one percent, slightly larger to cover your ground. Especially if you know you made eighty thousand last year and you're gonna make eighty two thousand this year, the, the minuscule difference, but the little bit more that you you withhold will still cover that amount at the end of the year, right? So you'll still still receive a refund. Obviously, the idea would be to land it exactly so that you you owe zero dollars and and the government owes you zero dollars, but that never happens because you can't tell the future. Right, so estimated tax payments with a little wiggle room, just just so that if you end up owing more than you thought you would, there is that wiggle room, there is that grace boundary comfort space that you could also factor into your calculation. 
right? That's all I'm saying. So just a little bit more, I would say. So maybe maybe you will make a, a bunch more money because some some div, div game dev approached you and they're like, we love you. We want you to be the main character. We pay 250 two hour minimum and we're going to have at least like 40, 50, 60 hours of you recording. <laughs> I don't know, right? And they're, you're like, oh yeah. And next year you're going to make a whole lot of money. If you know how this works, you can you can plan for it. Yes. You can plan for it. Estimate what your taxes might be. Tax rate, how it's calculated, X, Y, Z. Again, it doesn't have to be exact, obviously. It's, it's impossible to be exact. But afford a little more cushion, a little more wiggle room on top, so that you're not surprised with a tax bill at the end of the year. Federal taxes, right? That's how it's calculated. Some general advice about withholding yourself, by yourself, just a little bit more than what's calculated. State tax. Uh, some states don't require state income tax. So if you live in these states, you don't pay state tax. As, as best I know. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, but you don't pay state income tax if you live in these states. Um, some states will have a flat income tax. If you live in these states, there's a certain percentage that you pay flat on what you made, right? Um, everybody else, like California, will simply follow the the uh, graduated rate that the federal income tax uses. Uh, the same idea, the method, the the numbers in the brackets might be different, but the the principal methodology of how to calculate your tax, uh, other states will use it like that. California does. Again, single filing status, $80,000 a year, right? And, and in 2003, uh, 2023, uh, these, are, these were the figures. Uh, the 2024 numbers, at the, at the time I made this uh, slideshow, wasn't available yet. Um, so 20, 2023 numbers were like this. And if you made $80,000, you fall in the category, in the bracket of 68,350 to 349,137. It's the same, only calculated a little bit different. The idea of a graduated rate is the same, but the numbers, the calculations are a little bit different. That, that's all. But the same idea. Start from the bottom with me. If you made eighty thousand dollars, you'll fall in that in that bracket. So you add up, like this bracket, this bracket, this bracket, and you add up those numbers, and it comes out to three thousand nine dollars and forty three uh, by forty cents. Three thousand nine dollars and forty cents is what comes out to if you make all the way up to sixty eight thousand three fifty. So if your taxable income this year came out exactly, exactly to 68350 your California state income will be $3,009.40. But obviously, 80000 is larger than 68350 and the difference between 80000 and 68350 is $11,650. And the 9.3% of 11650 is $1,800. $1,083.45, if you will. And you add those together, comes to $4,092.85, which, you get, which gets a, a, a added on top of the self-employment tax, the federal income tax, and now the state income tax. Graduated calculation, graduated rate. So how... Do I know? Google it. Uh, visit your state's tax board, right? You're the, 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 the department that's, that's in charge of this. And your state name, income tax calculator, it'll, it'll tell you how much you owe. Punch in a number and it'll tell you. It'll do, do, it'll do the calculations for you and it'll tell you. Um, while it does the work for you, I personally believe it's important to know how it's calculated so I'm aware. Right? Okay, okay. Um, and state tax in California, you can also pay the state taxes in estimated quarterly taxes. So because I am a voice actor in Los Angeles, in California, I, every time I pay the federal uh, uh, estimated quarterly estimated tax payments, I also pay the state 
on the same day. Boop, 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 four times a year. Full time and the friends and high Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the six hundred is the six hundred dollars is indeed recorded as a freelancer income, your entrepreneurship income. It counts into your total income uh, uh, number that'll place you in a certain tax bracket, right? But in your instance, Riley, and other, other folks who have a full-time job or a part-time job as an employee, and they are also a voice actor making non, non-employee non uh, independent contract income, you'll receive a W-2 and the 1099 NEC for anything, any clients that paid you 600 or more. And it all adds to a single number of taxable income on your end. Because you're a sole prop, which we'll talk about down the down the down the in this in this lecture, indeed. <laughs> right, Schedule C. If you want to start googling and reading, feel free. Schedule C. Uh, uh, I got you. I'll ex- I'll explain more as we go. Uh, 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 some counties across the country and some cities across the country also require you to pay local income tax on top of the self-employment, the federal, the state, now the local tax. For example, if you live in San Francisco, you have to pay 0.38% of your taxable income to the city of San Francisco. Wilmington, Delaware, and other places across the country. Do you have to pay in your local? Do you know? Or have you been evading taxes locally? You bad entrepreneur, you. <laughs> something, to, something to look into, right? Something to look into. <laughs> so, if you make $80,000 in LA, in California, this is what it looks like. The 15.3% of the self-employment tax, which is Medicare and Social Security, comes out to $12,240. The federal income tax at that bracket, as calculated, is $12,653. And the state income tax, as we just calculated, is $4,092.85. And the taxes alone come out to $28,985.85. Taxes of the 80% that you made. And that comes out to be about 36.23%. And if you're paying 36% of your income as taxes, that's that's very high. That's high, isn't it? Imagine being paid a hundred imagine getting hired for a hundred dollar job and receiving, I don't know, sixty-two dollars and seventy-seven cents. That, that doesn't bode well. <laughs> you know, it doesn't bode well. Um, so, in an effort to reduce, because the less taxable amount, less, no, a smaller number for which you are liable means you'll pay less taxes. Yes? So, There are various ways to reduce that taxable amount of $28,985, or $80,000, rather. Taxable amount, the the amount that you're liable for. Through the deductions. You've heard about deductions somewhere. I'm sure of it. I'll write it off, write it off my taxes. When people say you can write it off your taxes, this is what they mean. Tax deductions. An effort, a transaction, the money that goes out of your pockets that you can qualify or 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 throw into reducing the taxable amount. Okay? Okay. Two options. Two. Federally speaking, two options. Number one, you can take a standard deduction. Standard. And if you're a single filer in 2024, the current year that we're in, you can take a standard deduction of $14,600. No questions asked. No document required. No record required. Uh, auditor is not going to look at this. Uh, you simply take 
say to IR to the IRS, I'm going to take a standard deduction of $14,600 because that's the number that they came up with that every American average or otherwise can simply just take. No questions asked. You could. You could. And that amount that amount gets reduced from the 80,000, reducing your taxable amount, saving you money. Yay. Right? Standard across the board. Uh, it's a lot less work because you don't have to keep track of your expenses, <laughs> right? And there's no questions asked. No, 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 no paperwork and records are required. Uh, you don't have to itemize anything, right? 14,600. You can just take it. It's a lot less work. And, and maybe you made like this much money. <laughs> <laughs> right this much money and and the amount of, of qualifying tax deductions so you bought a microphone you you built you bought materials to build your home studio right you paid for coaching and training you travel to places to for voiceover related things you paid for marketing your website the demos all the things you paid for right <laughs> And and then you add it all up at the end of the year, and it's less than fourteen thousand six hundred, right? Then it would be in your it would be in your best interest to take the standard deduction, right? Because it's bigger, it's bigger, it's larger, right? Therefore, less taxable amount, <laughs> right? Um, but what if you paid more than fourteen k fourteen six in a given year? What if you paid more? Well, you could go that way as well through the itemized deductions in Schedule C. And it is more work because you have to now uh, keep a record of all the money you've spent, all the, all the qu deductions that are, that are qualifying in an effort to reduce that taxable amount, right? It's more work, but you will get to reduce the taxable amount for far, far more, hopefully far more than 14600 What if this year you spent 23000 Random, random number. What if you spent $23,000 in your business expense this year, and it's far greater than 14600 right? Then your taxable amount becomes a lot smaller than the standard. It would make obvious sense, right, to, to reduce that tax. Liability. <laughs> Between the standard deduction and the itemized uh, deductions, right? Itemized uh, uh, Schedule C. Which one gives you the bigger deduction? The tax software that you'll use, wherever you may go and whichever you, want, you may use, uh, will figure this out for you. It will. Uh, unless you do your taxes on your own by hand, whatnot. What and you can... Uh, to be more in control of what you're doing. Um, but you should run the numbers in both scenarios and see where you fall. Because it's your business. <laughs> okay, <laughs> moving on. Again, same thing. California, $80,000. And if we take the standard deduction of 14600 this is how it looks. Because now we're not calculating on 80,000. 80, we're calculating off of 65,400. 80K minus 14,6, right? Because the taxable amount is now 65,400 and not 80,000. The, the self employment tax number, the federal income tax number, and the state income tax numbers become different because now you're in a different tax category. And the, ta and the, and the, and the tax that you end up owing becomes 22,220 as opposed to 28,985,85. Standard deduction. Again, no paperwork, no records, none of it is required. They, you just take the standard and, and they go, okay. Again, the real question is, I, I don't know your business, your, your, senses, your finances, right? Does your itemized list of deductions 
bring your taxable income to lower than $65,000 or bigger than $14,600. For my case, FYI, from my specific, very personal, individual, unique, June Yoon, this, uh, this business that I run, yes, my deduction is significantly larger than $14,600. So I use Schedule C. So I do. I use itemized deductions. Therefore, I keep meticulous records of everything that I spend, all the all the deductions as best I can. Claim all of it in an effort to drive down the taxable income. More information about that. Personally, right? This is not. This is not business related. Personally, as a human, not as a business, not as an entrepreneur, not as, not as anything, but as a human being, as a person, as a citizen, as a legal resident of this country, you can, you can reduce that amount personally through things like these. Uh, copy and paste that link now if you'd like, uh, or, or Google for it, or take a look at it afterwards and after this lecture. There's a list of dedu deductible expenses personally from your taxes. Right, things like money that you put in an IRA, business use of your car, which we do, right? All these things, alimony, bad debts, and capital losses, whatnot. You can use these things to reduce the taxable income, so you pay less taxes, more money in your pocket. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna go through every one, obviously, but it's on the IRS's website. They tell you, Google for this. Same thing for business as well. Um, that's the website, a different one for businesses. And you are indeed a business, a uh, sole prop. And there's a, there's a whole link of how to do how to, how to figure out which expenses are deductions, but pretty much FYI, TLDR, pretty much every time you spend money or do things that require money, like driving, gas, and, and wear and tear of your car, da, da 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 Every time you do things in the interest of furthering your voice over business, you can you can you can take it off your taxes. You can consider it a deductible expense. Here are some examples. <laughs> um hot sauce. Look at the look at the bottom right, right next to etc. Hot sauce. How in the world can I justify hot sauce as a business ex as a business expense? <laughs> I, before no 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 just, just let me uh, hold on hold on hold on <laughs> hold on. <laughs> uh. Was it was it 2022? I th I think it was 2022. Uh, it was a fantastic year. It was a great year for my business. 2022. I at the end of the year, as as holiday gifts, to say thank you for hiring me, thank you for working with me, thank you for blah, 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 I bought hot sauces for people <laughs> as a gift. As a, it's also it's it's also in the box. Bottom left side has gifts, twenty five bucks. You can give a gift to your client, for example, to your agent, right? To to the casting director, you can give them a gift that's worth about twenty five dollars and write it off your taxes. <laughs> so I sent. $25 worth of hot sauce to studios that I worked in in that one year, to the directors I worked with that one year, to the audio engineers, to the agents, obviously. Hot sauces. And I got to write every single one of that off of my taxes, reducing my taxable income. <laughs> Books about voice acting. Right, it is indeed furthering your knowledge and awareness about the industry and about this craft. So, if you purchased voice acting books or acting books or books about business, about audio, 
I don't know, if educational books that, that helped you in your business and you kept the receipt, you can write it off your taxes, reducing the taxable income. The state tax that you pay, okay? The state tax that you pay is a deductible item in the federal tax. <laughs> Okay, the 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 four thousand, three thousand, two thousand, whatever number it was in the previous slides, that number is a deductible expense in the federal tax. Did you claim your state taxes as a business expense in your federal taxes last year? I hope you did. <laughs> you know. Imagine, think about the Wi-Fi routers. Right? It, you look at imagine the foot hammock that I have under my desk that allows me to sit in a in a in a more upright position that allows me to be more productive at my desk. Uh, for my own purposes, inside this new building that I have, inside this new building that I have built as a home office exclusively for use in voice acting, I'm gonna write all this off. Yes, I am. For my own business, I have a separate ISP, internet service provider. I have a separate ISP for my own, for this computer in this office. That's different than my home use, personal use ISP. You may, I get to write all of it off because it's purely 100% for business. Juan, shoe insoles. Why, right? Because I'm a character voice actor. And it is better, arguably, if I stand and act, whether it's in here or in a client's studio, Juwan. Shoe insoles that make me feel more comfortable in a standing position, therefore allows me to perform at a higher degree and, and maintain the stamina of my performance. Shoe insoles. Mind blown. Thank you very much. Neat, indeed. That's inc it's not incredible. It's practicality. It's justifiable. That's so, Dylan. How loosely connected it has to be justifiable. So when the auditor comes around, and I'm sure the auditor who's looking at my bunch of list of receipts and transactions, they're gonna go shoe insoles. I have to be able to explain and justify how it benefits my business. And shoe insoles indeed do. It's hard standing for four hours straight. Of course, shoe gel shoe insoles to make it more comfortable so that I can stay maintain my stamina in that session, whether it's here or in a client session. Right? Booth fan. Ninja Pepakwa. Of course. Right? <laughs> Uh, all the all the all the all, normal things, um, all the workshops you've ever taken through Red Side Studio, tax deductible. <laughs> I've cosplayed as Amber. Dig through Twitter to find those pictures. <laughs> I've cosplayed as Amber. I've made Amber content, right? This whole thing, and the Baron Bunny Amber, is part of my identity. Yes, would you not agree? Part of my identity as a voice actor, as a streamer even. And having this in my background of the video that you're watching as part of my background in my presentation to you as a business person conducting business, this adds to my brand. Will that be there for my streams? When I, when I stream, yes. Can rent play into that? Indeed, if you if you designate uh, the section of your apartment as a home studio, and you will home office, and you should, you can deduct that. Not the whole percentage of that. Say, say that Susie, your apartment, let's say, is th one thousand square feet, one thousand. And 300 square feet of that 1,000 is your home office. That's 30%. Yeah? You can deduct 30% of your rent as home office. 
Google more about that. There is there's more complications that go into that, nuances and restrictions about exclusivity and stuff like that. But yes, you can. Utilities as well. Wi-Fi, water, trash, electricity, 30%. What happens if they disagree? As long as the justification isn't too out there. Right, uh, I purchased a farm in Iowa in order to exp- to to progress my voiceover business. That's too far, <laughs> right? You wouldn't be making those decisions in the first place anyway. So some of it is some of it is uh, um, honor system, quote unquote. I suppose you know in an analogical way, maybe because um, you have and because there's a desire to progress your voiceover business without cheating the tax code, right? Um, a lot of the stuff that you, the money the money that you'll spend on the time that you'll spend is indeed to for to move forward your voiceover business, and because it is intendedly so, you should be able to justify all of it. And tax auditors are not monsters who are looking for nitpicky corners and 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 vulnerable openings to exploit. They just want an answer, and if it makes sense to everybody all around. Unless you get a horrible auditor who's very tired. I don't know. I hope it never happens, right? But it's not a it's not a sense of if they they'll only disagree if you I, I'm not an authority. Again, I'm not a tax professional. They'll only disagree if it's indeed disagreeable. <laughs> you don't need a private jet as a voice actor. Right? That's ridiculous. Unless you have a team of lawyers on hand to justify that for you. Audiobooks and games can count too. Indeed, indeed. Uh, uh, so, like, f- audiobooks that you listen to, right? So that you get a sense of what it sounds like, what the narrators do, and study absolutely counts. The games that you play, that you study voice acting for, absolutely counts. Should you make a record and an evidence of your learning, the purpose for which you bought this thing? Yes, you should. Yes, you should. Um, say you go to the theater to watch Transformer 1, right, with Evan Michael Lee. Love that guy, right? Because Evan Michael is in it, and you want to, went to go see it, and the voice acting is phenomenal, of course, right? And you come home, and you write a little note, today's date, and a little da-da-da-da, it was awesome. Uh, the voice acting was great. Evan Michael killed it. I particularly enjoyed it when he said this line in this way, when that thing happened. And I think that's something I can implement into my, into my thing. Save. Put it, tuck it away. And now there's evidence and paper trail of your business, your actor, your progression documented. Justifying that expense. Can confirm the voice acting was Gucci. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Same thing for video games. Reducing the taxable amount. Yes, reducing the taxable amount. You drive a car, or you you get on a plane, you ride the train, whatever. But if you drive your personal car, like you didn't buy a separate car for voice acting only, right? That'd be ridiculous. Why would you do that? But if you did, great, you know? <laughs> this is the car that I drive to workshops. Great. I'm so glad you have a lot a lot of money. That's fantastic. But if you're like me, uh, you would use your personal vehicle to use for business purposes, to go to things like workshops that are in town, right? You can deduct 65.5 cents per mile. That you drive from point A to point B for voiceover related things. So every time I have to drive to a studio to work, because they want me in studio and they don't want me to connect remotely, fine. I record, I I, I Google, I I could, I could like track it with my phone. Uh, I simply Google it from my address to the studio and it gives me. Mile numbers, right? 65.5 cents per mile. 
so far in 2024, I'm reaching like three thousand plus dollars in deductions by driving. It's October. It's been ten. It's it's almost almost eleven months. And but my point is, it adds up. It add it really adds up. So, recording sessions, workshop, in person workshops you will attend. Right, you have you you're meeting an agent agent for the first time to consider partnership. You drive to their office and you pay the 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 parking ticket in the in the structure. All of that, all of that counts. <laughs> Say that your local voice acting community has a meetup for networking in this restaurant that's ten miles away. That counts. Business, networking, putting putting names to faces, shaking hands. That totally counts. Sixty five point five sixty five point five cents per mile. Home to there and from there to home. Because you have to come back. It counts. Okay? <laughs> Obviously, keep meticulous records of these things, right? Addresses and number of miles, the purposes of all the things. Keep meticulous records. In addition, because this car is being used for personal and for business, what I would advise everybody do, January 1st, you write down the odometer. And on December 31st, you write down the odometer. And then it tells you total miles driven, Minus the business miles you've driven, giving you a number for business and a number for personal. Uh, but only the voiceover business trips or voiceover related trips count. So say you go to this workshop in this studio from home. So from home to the studio, that those miles count. And after the workshop, you stop by the grocery store to pick up some milk or whatever food you want to eat. And then you come home. The trip from that, that trip doesn't count. Say I have two sessions today, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, in the late afternoon. So I travel from my house to the first studio. That trip counts. From the studio to the restaurant to have lunch doesn't count. <laughs> you know? And from lunch to the other studio, I would not count it. Could you? You could justify it, but I wouldn't because I'm right there. Instead, I would go from this studio to this studio. That mile, I would count. And from the second studio back home, yeah, that counts. It has to be the in individual leg of the journey has to be related to furthering working on your voiceover business. For voice actors. Like this this is different if you run a restaurant. This is different if you if you if you are a tech company, you know? But for voice actors, specifically for you and me, for voice actors, I would argue this is the linear linear progression of your tax structure journey. Again, I'm not a tax professional, I'm not a finance professional. Take my words with a grain with a cup of salt. <laughs> In this order, the first place you start out is sole prop, sole proprietor. Uh, you are the business. You don't you don't have to declare that you're a business. You don't have to say submit any forms. You don't have to write to your local newspaper and publish that you're a business. You can just be a business. You, you can just decide to be a business. And when you do, you will become classified as the sole proprietor. Uh, it's the classic definition of a freelancer. An artist who one day decides to sell their art. Uh, imagine driving for Uber, right? Um, you decided to drive for Uber. You didn't have to fill out a form to the government declaring that you're going to be an Uber driver. You just... This decided. So you went to Uber, you went to Lyft, whatever, and you filled out, filled out their forms, went through their registration, they checked out your car, da 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 da, and now you're an Uber driver. And you're a sole prop business owner. You're an artist. Maybe you make bracelets, right? And you're like, okay, I, I want to sell these. 
So you open up an Etsy, Etsy shop and you sell bracelets. You are a sole proprietor, right? Everybody can be. If you're a citizen of the United States, legal resident of the United States, you can simply just be a business. At the very basic, at the very beginning of your journey, sole proprietorship can be just your business. It's literally you. And the clients that you work with, the customers that you serve, it is a direct, trans direct transactional relationship between you and the client. In that W-9 that you'll submit, uh, you'll have to give them your social security number because they have to know who you are in order to pay you and, and have it for their records, you know? Uh, they have to have your social or tax ID number, which social is. If you're a sole prop, simply you are the business. And everything we talked about so far apply to you directly. Self-employment tax, all the things. Everything so far applies to you, sole prop, business person. And because you are the business, you are the business. If somebody brings a lawsuit... You are responsible. Now, in the world of voiceover, in general, again, ge in general, right? Nothing specific. Um, the the foreseeable argument, argument, arguably the foreseeable area where you might receive a significant, sizable size of lawsuit would be breaking an NDA. And your contract in the NDA will say that, right? Uh, we'll seek irreparable damages. Guess what they're going to come after? Your personal assets. House, car, bank, money in your personal bank, retirement, whatever it is that you have listed as your asset, they can take. If they win the suit, you are liable. You are liable if you're sued. Don't you dare break an NDA. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> and it's easy, right? Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> keep your keep your your keyboard shut. Uh, keep everything shut. Indeed, don't break NDA. Don't give anyone a reason to sue you. Obviously, right? But. You are liable to assist, to, to, if you will, add a layer, if you will. You can be or apply to be a, a, a single member LLC, single member limited liability company, a corporation, sorry, single member limited liability corporation. SMLLC, in which you are the owner of a business entity. Okay? Like, imagine forming a business that you own, own me. <laughs> just, just you, right? Uh, 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 some clever name, LLC, a company that you run by yourself. A single member, limited liability. Limited liability, which means you are still very much a freelancer because it's just you. You're not a corporation with 100 employees, just you, single member. But you are indeed a business with paperwork and documentation, which legitimizes you as a business in the eyes of corporate and in the eyes of law because you have paperwork and documentation as an LLC. And when you work with other clients who hire you for things, they're not hiring you, they're hiring the LLC. They're hiring the business, not you, the person Right, but they're hiring the business which you operate. And because it is a shield, a layer between you and the client as a limited liability corporation and entity that stands in front of you, if you're sued, the LLC takes the damage. 
not you, the person, and your car and your house, which everything is listed under your name as a personal asset, are not touchable by the suing entity, by the by the other other party. The LLC who has signed the contract is responsible. Additionally, if you have a single member LLC, you are required to have an EIN, employer identification number. And it's essentially the same thing as a social security number. Your SSN identifies you, the individual, the human, the person in the system of the United States as a person. Yes. EIN is like that for business entities. It's, a, it's the number that identifies your business. So in the W-9 that you submit into this client, because they're hiring your LLC and not you, you will write down the EIN. Therefore, protecting your sensitive data of social security number from everybody else who sees that W-9. It'll, it'll, it'll take some money, right? Uh, the state agencies that you live in will need to process that. And that number varies. The requirements vary from state to state. Well, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but anybody can make anybody can make an LLC, single member LLC. If in 2024, since the first day of this year up until today, October 26, 2024, in the last almost 11 months that have gone by, inside those 10 months plus of time in those il almost 11 months of time you made 250 bucks from your voice acting journey you don't need an llc you don't right you don't but if you made eighty thousand dollars you should <laughs> you should <laughs> so and and that and that threshold differ from person to person, right? And, and, and again, I'll talk more about more structures as we, as we go down this list here. Um, again, a single member, let's see, everything still applies. The self-employment self tax rate, the federal tax, everything still apply, indeed. Um, <laughs> costs. Costs. California is probably the most probably it is I think if I'm if I'm correct California is the most expensive state to have a a, a company an LLC. Uh, for example, I have a single member a single single member LLC that I've been operating all this time. I pay. To the state of California, to have this single-member LLC, I pay to California $800 annually just to have an, an LLC, an LLC tax. Even if I do zero business, right? If I don't, if I don't make any money, if I, if I do, do nothing with my business this year, I still have to pay them $800 bucks just to have the business. Uh, if I'm correct, no other state in the union has stuff like that, uh, amount like that. If I recall, Texas is pretty cheap. Some states, it's free to have an LLC. There is no cost involved in having a business. It, it varies wildly from state to state. One time fee of 300. Thank you, Dylan. Ohio, no annual fee, 99 one-time charge, $800 every year. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Dylan. Yes, indeed. Ah, piercing the corporate veil. Indeed, we'll talk about that in the finances section. Yes, indeed. And there are other forms of LLC, like partnership, right? other forms of LLC that exist out there to satisfy the corporate world, but they're not really applicable to us voice actors. They're, they're just not, so I'm not going to talk about them. If you're a single member LLC, it's a pass-through entity. Uh, it mean, that means you are indeed uh, the operator, the person, the entity that exists inside this system. And the LLC is just a name, just a puppet. Uh, when you eat through the puppet, it still goes into your stomach. Uh, <laughs> it's just a, a pass-through. It's a thing that exists to, to affront you. It's a mask, if you will. You still talk and eat with your mouth and see through your eyes, but you have a mask on. Imagine that. Single member LLC, that's pass-through entity. The IRS considers you just as, still as very much as a sole prop. 
a sole proprietor, a single member LLC uh, entrepreneur. Uh, the way taxes are calculated, the way you're considered legally doesn't change in any way. You are still very much an entrepreneur of a single person. Even if you have a single member LLC, you're a pa- it's a pass-through entity that solely exists to legitimize you via paperwork and to shield you from liability, limited liability. Same thing, use it on W-9, protect the social security number. Uh, For my instance, I live in this house, which has a a certain address, but my business, my LLC, is located in this this, uh, uh, postal place where they have mailboxes. So if you were, okay, if you were to go to California Small Businesses website and search for my business, you can. If you were, if you were to go to California's uh, Small Businesses website and search for my business entity, you'll find it there, Red Site LLC, with an address that is not this house. <laughs> it, it's not this house. Therefore, I get to protect my private information of my social security and my address away from the forms that I have to fill out in order to work. It's worth it, 100%, wherever you may be, as long as it makes financial sense, of course. The idea here is that having an LLC with documentation, with paper trail, and XYZ things, uh, you are legitimized as a business, uh, away away from the hobbyists, if you will, uh, in the in in the business sense, in the entrepreneurial context, uh, for in the eyes of the IRS, if you will. You can take your single member single member LLC and opt to be taxed like an S corp, S corporation. Uh, so structurally, if everything stays the same, but the way you pay your taxes, it can be different. Um, where the LLC becomes this big, full blown out company, company, uh, where you get, where you get to classify your role inside the company as the owner and the employee. Legal technical jargon of employee. Employee, <laughs> right? Where the LLC pays you a salary, reasonable. There's a whole, please, YouTube slash Google, reasonable salary for S Corp LLCs. There's a lot of content and, and warnings. I'm not going to dig into it here because we don't have time, but you are considered now an employee of the LLC that you own. And because you're not a self employed person anymore, you don't pay the self-employment tax on your uh, on your wage. <laughs> you know, everybody pays the fifteen point three percent self-employment tax, indeed. But you don't, you don't, you don't, because you're an employee. Employee. And this goes deeper, much, much deeper into the into the weeds and the jargons of the tax structures in this way. Uh, but thankfully, thankfully uh, for you and me, uh, thankfully it's not like it's it's not recommended that you do this off the get go. It, it doesn't make financial sense, uh, and 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 the compliance. Compliance checklist that you have to satisfy to the uh, government governing agencies. It's not worth it, if you will. Um, so, for example, eighty thousand dollars you made, right? And your reasonable salary could be forty five thousand. And the the LLC's taxable income is thirty five, which changes things, right? In terms of what, how much pay you tax. So you'll save some money, not a drastic amount, but you'll save some money. A chunkable and chunky enough to make the decision, which I'm considering for 2025, maybe. Um, but we shall see. But deductibles combine all of that again. The effort, the idea, the intention is to minimize the tax liability, to minimize the taxable income as as low as possibly it can go, right? So that more money stays in our pocket. Do you still pay your taxes? Yes, you do, right? Be a responsible citizen. My wife is a teacher. Please pay her salary, right? 
uh, and she loves her job. She's very gr- she's great at what she does. Um, but still pay taxes while keeping as much as we can. There are other LLCs, other corporations. Again, but for voice actors, it's not really really uh, applicable. As Aisha said, uh, S corp op- uh, option as well. If you're an S corp and going to that tax structure, you can be a loan out company where the studios union jobs too, where studios hire the company uh, that that loans you the actor, the person out to work. That's a whole like that's a whole complicated, nuanced uh, pro- processes and procedures that'll come later. Once you start to make, as I've been told by CPAs and other tax professionals, I've been told that unless you make about sixty thousand dollars, that around that point in your journey is when the S corp status starts to make sense financially. And in terms of compliance, you have to have like annual meetings and you have to keep take notes, all the things you have to do to satisfy the compliance aspect of running a business with the state. And financially speaking, I've been told about 60,000 in, in, in the salary, in the money that you make as a voice actor, as a, as a, as an independent contractor in all the things that you do combined together about 60,000 and where it starts to make financial sense. To elect for S corp, um, but having this research and having this awareness kind of gives you an idea of where you could go. Right now, I would imagine most of you, most of you are sole prop, sole proprietor, right? <laughs> you don't, you, you don't have an LLC. You're operating out of your own business, right? Your LLC, and eventually, eventually, you'll be faced with. Higher paying, higher, bigger caliber, whatever, however, descri- whatever description you want to use, um, your business will become more serious in whatever context and interpretation you may take that as. And as your business becomes more businessy, I suppose, having the legitimacy of an LLC documentation that they can research behind you to find out uh, certainly, it certainly raises the raises the confidence on their end. Uh, to for them to know that oh, we're dealing with like somebody who's who's really uh, serious about this, they have a company structure, blah 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 blah, all the things you know. So, uh, do consider the benefits of having an LLC. That makes financial sense, obviously. Um, again, if you're in Virginia, if you're in Texas, whatever money that you pay one time to have a business, like, of course you should. I think. Um, but if you're in California and you don't and paying 800 bucks a year, no matter what, just to have the LLC doesn't make sense, then you shouldn't make one, right? Financial sense. Uh, but know that it brings benefits like limited liability, that it'll take the brunt of the damage for you. We'll talk about piercing the corporate veil here in a moment. And other uh, benefits like using an EIN instead of SSN, having a business address, all the things can be a benefit, if that matters to you personally. For some, it's fine, right? Uh, individual personal choices and, and entrepreneurial choices. In the tax portion of this tax and finances, as I, as I say, it was the bigger chunk. In the final section here, what I might advise. Again, I'm not a tax professional. I'm not a finance, finance professional either. My advice, take it or leave it. Cup of salt, drink it down. Um, I want you to consider opening up a savings account, business savings account. We'll talk about that in the, in the finance side. And every time you get paid for your voiceover work, transfer that percentage that we talked about in the beginning, that percentage of your payment into the account, and just let it accrue. Unfortunately, you're not going to make much money on it unless you find that one online bank account that pays 45 Percent, maybe, maybe in, enough to pay for a nice dinner per quarter, maybe, right? Whatever. And uh, automatically understand that you have to transfer that amount to that account. I do it once a month. I have a running spreadsheet. I do it once a month. So at the end of the month, I'll tally up the money that I've made, the income that's come in, my expenses, da 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 da. My spreadsheet has spits out this thing. And I transfer that much 
into the savings account, in the business savings account that I use for that sole purpose of keeping money socked away so that four times a year, I can pay the taxes that I'm due, that, that I owe to the governing body bodies as I, as I do four times a year. A little bit over so that I can have a refund at the end. But do the very best you can because that money is going to sit there. Right, as you as you tuck it away every month or every time you get paid, whatever your process that you'll establish, that money will just sit there, right? So you might as well have it in a higher paying one. And once a quarter, when you pay the things, you'll look at all the interest that's accrued. Might be enough to for, uh, for a nice lunch, right? <laughs> so do consider it. Yes, indeed. I I withhold thirty two percent, generally speaking. Now, it differs from year to year as my own journey and progress moves down this path of voice acting and other things. It changes, obviously, but I personally withhold 32% of my pay. Again, a little bit more than what I calculate out to be, obviously, to have that refund at the end. You know what I mean? But eh, I don't want to pay tax bills. I want, I want to receive a refund. <laughs> And if you think about it, like if you put if you pay too much, you're giving them the money, but there is no interest being accrued, accrued there either, right? So I don't want to withhold 40%. That's too much. That's too much money that I'm say that I'm paying to the government for them to just hold it, right? And and pay me back in a refund at the end of the year without any sort of interest accruing. I don't want to do that either. That's dumb, right? So I pay, I withhold this amount that I'm that I'm supposed to plus just a little bit on top. And for me, that number is 32% for 2024. Yeah, and 10 for state. <laughs> um it's because no, nothing has really changed drastically until something might in the future. Who knows? No one knows. <laughs> Uh, also, take a look at the W-2s and the 1099s that come in, right, for the, pre the, the year before. Take a look at it. Should I take the standard, because it provides the most benefit, my expenses that I've, that I've itemized anyway, add up to be less than the standard deduction, then it's a no-brainer. Right, but should you find that all the expenses that you've spent this year exceeds that fourteen thousand plus whatever for an even better benefit in re in reducing your taxable income amount, then obviously you should go with the itemized deduction, maximizing the tax, maximizing uh, the, the 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 money in your pocket, if you will. Um, and, and the estimated tax payments that you'll do it will incorporate all of this. And you'll ho hopefully you pay a little bit more, but not too much more than what you owe. And you'll end up with a little refund, which is always nice, you know. Um, generally speaking, generally speaking, save everything, obviously, right? Create for yourself a system where you save everything. Receipts as well, dates and number, a spreadsheet. A Google Sheet is an obvious choice with pictures of receipts on the store somewhere else. But a, a extensive, meticulous, and you're, you're running a business, right? Meticulous, detailed records of all the finances that has occurred this calendar year. So that you can make an informed decision about how to how to file for taxes and what you can expect. Finances, um, taxes is uh, uh, taxes are very much very much individual because you live. We all live in different states, and our life circumstances are different in terms of the the the, the travel in this path as a voice actor. Uh, the personal situations that we're in, our other obligations, whatever it might be, uh, just like everybody else's journeys, one voice actor's tax structure and numbers should not be used in the same way as this other person. It, you just can't. It's so highly individualized in this way. But for finances, it's a lot more directional. 
there is a lot more commonality because it's more common sense based than than specific instances of taxation for voice actors. Finances is going to be more about the more about the best practices, if you will. Um, and one of those best <clears throat> one of those best practices separate the personal and business accounts meticulously. Meticulously. <laughs> Um, number one, if you have a business checking account and a personal checking account, and you only use the personal checking account for personal expenses and business checking account for business expenses, it legitimizes your business in its operation and its existence. At least, if anything, it makes it easier for the tax auditor knocking on your door to, to, to be presented to, present it to that person as evidence. Have a personal checking account, which I'd imagine you already do, right? Open a business checking account. Now, you can't just walk into a bank and be like, I want to open a business account. You can't do that. Uh, because they need an EIN. Uh, every legal resident slash citizen of the United States can apply for a free, free EIN for your sole prop. You are a business. Therefore, you are entitled to an EIN, employer identification number, an EIN. And it's, uh, like, it's like social, but for your business, Right. That's an identification number. And the bank needs that number in order to open a business account. Now, could you open a, a, another personal account and have two personal checking accounts and, and just label it in, in your mind as personal and business? You can, but you might as well open a business account. <laughs> To, to legitimize it. You know what I mean? You, you might as well. I don't know. It's free. You might as well. Uh, there's going to be processes of verification that your bank will do, right? To make sure you're not some foreign body trying to scam people or trying to, trying to uh, money launder or whatever our purposes might be. So there'll be investigations and, and looking up your information by the bank. That They'll do that. They'll go through that process and, to, and legitimize you. But when they approve you, you will indeed be a legitimized business because you have this bank account from this bank who is also complying with the United States rules and their approval of your business account by connection is a legitimization of your business. Does that make sense? So, <laughs> using the EIN, have open a business checking account Using the EIN, you open a business PayPal, business Venmo, Venmo through your uh, business Venmo and Zelle through your bank, all the thing, business aspect of it. I have a business PayPal and personal PayPal. I have a business Venmo and personal Venmo. And they're used for personal uses and business uses, separating the two. Business savings account to tuck the money into for quarterly tax payments and things of that nature. And a business credit card so that your business can start to build its own credit score. Credit score. Build its own credit, if you will. Optionally. So take a look at this chart, this flow chart. The client pays you either directly into your business checking account or through PayPal or other things, and you transfer into your business checking account, and your business checking account starts to accrue money from day from the day one of this month until the end of the month. And at the end of the month, you pay yourself by transferring to your personal checking, at the same time, taking that per percentage of the tax thing to the savings account to, to sock away for the quarterly payments. Imagine some work, something like this working, for your business, because that's what I do. <laughs> this is what I do. And uh, I found that this is the, the solution that works the best uh, for me, indeed. And here's the EIN side. Um, if, you if you Google obtain an EIN and make sure to click on the irs.gov site, not some place that'll be like, we'll help you get an EIN. It's liter literally a single form. You can do that. You don't need to pay other entities $200 to have them do it for you. You can do it. It's easy. Um, 
and they'll give you an EIN, and and you can do these things as, as I just talked about. Um, it looks like this, and you, they'll ask you some questions. It's a five-step thing. You're a soul prop, right? Say, I'm a soul prop. I'm here to get an EIN. Hello. Da, 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 da. Woo. Here we go. Let me, here we go. And you start a new business, and then and then you'll finish the process, and then you have your EIN, uh, uh, and and with that EIN, and you can open the business account. Here's a piece of piece of advice: the IRS will send you a a letter, a paper letter in the snail mail through the USPS that says, "Congratulations, here's your EIN." Da 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 da. da. Do not lose that paper. <laughs> they'll they'll send it to you once. Once, uh, I think you can. I think you can request it if you lose it, but you have to pay for it, and you have to call them or write a letter to them and request it. It's it's a headache and a plus. Uh, uh, do not lose that paper. <laughs> the bank will need to see that for sure to open these accounts. Uh, keep it in a safe place, indeed. Uh, let's touch on that, that piercing the corporate veil. Um, the reason, uh, perhaps the large, uh, in, in addition to the legitimization of your business in this manner, um, the practice and habit, and it should be indeed a, a practice and a habit of separating your personal and your business in this way, is to indeed distinctly identify your business's activities as a business activity and your personal activity as a personal activity. Here's why it didn't matter. It's called piercing the corporate veil. Thank you for mentioning that. Imagine one day that you get hired in this in this video game right this huge like career changing video game and the role that you booked right this is going to change your career this thing and they're like okay here's the nda right so you're yeah you're sign it read it thoroughly agree with it sign it right and then you're bound to the nda and you work the job and do the th do the thing and then I don't know, a month after you fit, you wrap your character, there's a leak. There's a leak. Somebody has leaked whatever information to the internet that you didn't do, obviously, because you signed the NDA, right? You didn't do it. But there was a leak that compromised these, these very important things about the production, about the video game that no one was supposed to know, right? And... They do their internal investigation, da 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 da, and for some reason, <laughs> this is extreme. But for some reason, they conclude it was you, even though you didn't do it. Right? They were like, "It must have been you," because we looked into it. Every, da, da 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 da, it must have been you because of these reasons, whatever they may say, and uh, uh, they sue you. Right? They sue you. Um, thankfully, you have an LLC established for that limited liability, right? Even though you have an LLC, maybe you had been uh, making business purchases from your personal account and, 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 Spending personal expense from your business account, like mixing, even though you have a business set, set of business accounts and personal accounts, you've been like intermingling and, and spending from whatever account in whatever way, right? You went to the drive through to buy a burger for your lunch, to buy a burger from your business account. You paid for this workshop from your personal account. Whatever it might might be, right? And the bank transaction records show like there there's a there's a there's a mishandling, there's a there's a weaving of whatever expenses. The lawyers from that production company uh, can request that information from your bank, right? And they'll they can point to your behavior of disregarding the business structure and the personal structure because the evidence clearly shows 
that you two are intermingling in this way, personal to business in this way. And they can use that as the evidence to pierce the LLC, to pierce through the mask, the wall of the LLC, and reach into your personal assets because you've been mixing. That means your car, your house, your, your, your future pay, your 401k, all the things are now, now are assets that they have access to because they were able to pierce the corporate veil, pierce the corporate veil. So, number one, don't break NDAs. <laughs> number two, not that this will happen, right? It's, it's not going to happen. Not that it will happen, but some things could be out of our control. And we could be accused of things we didn't do. It, you could, yes? That's why we have, that's why we have insurance, Right, that you could get into an accident and some other person could be doing their thing, you could be held like that's why we have insurance LLC. And it is extremely important that you keep the transactions for your business from the business accounts and your personal from the personal accounts so that the paperwork that you can present. The paperwork that exists in the in the paper trail of your documentation clearly shows the separation between the two entities, your LLC and you, the person. Piercing the corporate veil. But for voice actors, I could see false accusation of NDA breaks and leaks whatnot could be could be a thing not that it will knocking on not not that it will not that it might ever come to come to come to terms but it might it could it may that's why we have insurance and the limited liability corporation that you place in front of you to to shield you from these things there's no point of having that if you don't have separated expenses and, and, and financial records between your business and your person, right? Another reason to, 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 to have a business. But like if, if, if some college student is doing a game jam, right? They make you sign an NDA and, and, and somebody accuses you of, of breaking the NDA and are they going to come after you with a team of lawyers? Probably not. Right, probably not. So, uh, maybe maybe you're working on this on this on this uh, indie level indie video game by a studio that's manned by one person, whatever. That they don't have the you're still not you're still gonna keep the NDA because you're a professional, right? But should something like this happen, they're not gonna come after you because they don't have the legal team, right? So. This idea of piercing the corporate veil in the highly, highly unlikely event of being accused for an NDA or other, some other catastrophic thing that's big enough for them to pursue you in this manner is not going to happen until you f progress further down the industry when you're dealing with the studios and the companies and other entities that have the means to pursue you in this way. Before you get there, however, it might be a better way to start to train yourself, number one, in and not NDA breaking, obviously, but to habituate yourself in the practices of a business owner, in the practices of an entrepreneur, so that two years from now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now, when you are dealing with these entities that are multi-billion dollars, whatever, and if you break something, they can come after you with ev for everything that you've got, you're prepared for that moment. Should it occur. It's not going to occur, but should it occur. <laughs> you know? Whew. You also have to know what is going on from day to day, from quarter to quarter, from week to week. Uh, as Aisha said, a wave is a free, free platform that you can sign up that'll help 
to maintain awareness of the financial activity in your account. It'll also help you to categorize, to fill out, to make, fill, to make filling out the Schedule C more expedient, right? Um, uh, it'll, it, it, you can connect it to your bank. It'll pull the transaction from there and list it on here. And then you can keep record of all your transactions by date, by category, for free. If you're not using Wave, you need to use Wave today. <laughs> Sign up for and 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 poke around, play around with it. Watch the tutorials and play around with it and habituate. Get used to habituate being in better control and awareness of your financial activity today. And Wave makes that available to you for free. I use QuickBooks. I have been using QuickBooks for, for years now. And, and even though I pay whatever dollar a month for it, uh, it's, it's tax deductible, <laughs> first and foremost, because it's for business use. Um, it, but it allows me... It, 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 I, like, I like it better. I like it better than Waves. I've tried Wave. I have. And I ended up not liking it. Uh, uh, it's the inability to uplo upload receipts. You have to pay extra for receipts. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, the user interface was a little wonky for me. I like, I'm used, I'm an old man. I got, I got habituated into the QuickBooks uh, workflow and it's GUI and it's functions. So I, I like where I am <laughs> and the monthly is not that, I think I pay 15, 16 a month. It used to be 10, uh, but I, I don't mind paying per month for the functionality and the familiarity that I'm used to. And it's not that much different, so it's fine for me, and and it's tax deductible anyway. So for me, it's okay. Um, it'll do miles and all the things, but I would if you ha if you don't have a habituation that's built for a financial software, then obviously Wave is the way to go because it's free and accessible to everybody. Indeed, not sponsored at all, not at all. I wish I was Adriana. I really, I wish I was. Please sponsor me. I don't know. <laughs> And look around. There are there are other solutions as well, but Wave is probably the most popular because it's free, um, and they'll upsell you. Try they'll they'll try to upsell you in the whole take pictures of your of your receipt and da 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 da, da. that that's their pitch. But it's free, so there you go. Uh, um, but whichever platform and service you may choose, um. As long as it makes importing the the transaction from your bank account to the platform, so that you can like do things with it, categorize it, calculate numbers, uh, whatever, uh, whatever else, you know, to help you uh, manage your finances in this manner, um, organizing and categorizing. Um, if it can, if it involves mileage tracking, I know QuickBook Quick QuickBook does. Uh, Invoicing, even payment processing, like my process is a little bit different, but you can do that as well. Invoice people, and when they pay via the platform, the money will automatically go to your bank account and stuff like that, right? Um, QuickBooks has a one-click tax prep where you, like, uh, QuickBooks is connected to TurboTax, and there's whole like thing behind QuickBooks and TurboTax about the current events, and I do want to get away from them, but I don't want to use Wave apps, so I'm looking. <laughs> uh, but uh, this one, this co company has, has TurboTax, so if you've been keeping, keeping records of your expenses and income in QuickBooks, it transfers that data automatically to TurboTax so that things are already in place because you've been keeping record this whole time, which makes it easier. Um, this year, we're going to try, like this for 2024, we're going to try free tax, free tax USA com if I'm not mistaken uh, could somebody can somebody Google that free free tax USA com I think is the is the website um, allows you to do taxes for free. Right? FreeTaxUSA.com, I think, Dylan. Thank you very much. I think that's the website. Um, allows you to do federal taxes for, for, for free. And it's online-based. Yay. It's this... I, I think it's by the IRS as well. 
I, the IRS also has, I know this for a fact, the IRS also has a, a software, a platform, a calculator, a, a, a processing means to file for your taxes on IRS's website as well. So more options are becoming available, indeed. These user, uh, thank you very much. A great side, using a few years now, user friendly. Good, thank you for that. Very good. Uh, directfilekicksass.com. <laughs> I love that. A Zoho suite of apps, Zoho books for book. I'm gonna have to look into that as well. Thank you, Evan. Um, but there are many options out there. But and whichever one that makes sense for you financially and it fits your workflow, stuff like that. Uh, I would definitely, indefinitely encourage and highly recommend that you uh, use that to keep track of your finances and be aware, be aware of your finances, indeed. Um, but if you end up paying for whatever platform, it's tax deductible. And if you itemize your things and it's above the standard deduction, then you might as well. Habituate. Habituate, 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 because if you don't make it into a habit, you're not going to do it. Or you'll do it for a while and it'll fall off because it's not a habit, you know? When paychecks come in, talk away the tax money, right? Talk away the tax money. If it was a union job, record the info because you, you have to record report that number to them every year. Record the information that come in every time, without fail, every time. I have a certain process for processing checks, the stubs, the records, my spreadsheet, my bank account. To, 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 to like clockwork, it just happens. Some of it automatic, some of it automated, some of it not. So I have to do it. Ta, 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 turns it into a habit. Every time you spend money on voice acting in any capacity, keep the receipt. I take a picture every time. Record the information, categorize the transaction, date it, number it, put it into the spreadsheet, however you want to do it. Keep a record of it. Because even if you end up taking the standard deduction at the end of the year, how will you know the standard deduction was indeed the way to go if you don't have an itemized list of your expenses this year, right? Keep record of it so that you have the option to go the other way for the larger deduction if it becomes available to you. Four times a year, just know that you have to pay these taxes four times a year. Quarterly taxes estimated four times. And other fees, like the, the California $800 one that I pay every January. Whew. I live and die by my calendar. Reminders and payments and, and due dates. Yes, indeed. Utilize these things and turn them into habits. Every time you drive, right? Addresses, miles, purposes... Habit, 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 habit. So if you didn't know, I also offer coaching sessions. And I plan to uh, incorporate this information. And as I learn more, even more so about these things moving forward. Uh, and I, I intend to help you with it as best I can. As, as I've said, everybody is different in every different state and every circumstance. And in a, in a big group session of 12 people, you can't divulge your private information in front of everybody, right? So in, in addition to the acting, in addition to the mentoring, the guidance and consultation, uh, career path or whatever, I'm, I'm also going to offer, it's already enabled now, on an option where we can talk about taxes and finances to help you the best, as best we can. This is the pitch portion uh, of, of this lecture. I'm so sorry. But it'll be super short, I promise. Um, my intention at the end of the day is, is want to help. Right, I want to help save you money. My gosh, uh, and should you book a session, that's what we'll talk about in this way. And every now and then, I plan to do like small groups, like get together with four of your friends and and request like a small group thing, so we can talk about these things in the privacy of the people that we know in this manner, so that we can, I don't know, become better aware of the money, the finances, the taxes, how to how to make these decisions about moving forward in your business. Um. Yeah, and dig deeper into these contexts. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's about being aware of the taxes that you have to pay, how those taxes are being calculated, because you have to pay the taxes, right? Death and taxes is what they say. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. And, and knowing how these are calculated and how they're paid and how they're operated, awareness of knowing is important. Why you're paying this money and why you're being asked to do these things. So you know, at the same time, 
supported by the habituation of good finances, methodology, and practices, in combination with the knowledge and awareness of taxes and things of that nature, brackets and calculations, is going to allow you to be a better entrepreneur, a better business person that runs a business called voice acting. And without that, I, in my opinion, without that foundational support system at the bottom that supports your business financially and executively as the owner of your business, without that financial fundamental support at the bottom, your business can't grow, in my opinion. Or it will grow and you'll start to f flounder. What do I do? It's better to know than not know, in my opinion. You know? Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for, for, for becoming more aware of finances and taxes in this way as a U.S.-based uh, voice actor or freelancer. Um, the intention is to help with information, with uh, applicable, practical steps that you can take today, now, so that you can make things happen. Yes, indeed. Approach a CPA, a tax professional, finance professional, with organized information, readily accessible and, and, and filterable and anal analyzable. Uh, they'll love you more. Thank you for having the in ready information organized and accessible. Thank you, thank you. And two, they don't have to sit there going through shoeboxes of receipts and enter them into a... They charge by the hour. All right, let's save you some money. Like I said at the top, uh, approach them with organized information. Yes, indeed. And again, I'm available for questions via DM, email, whatever you want to do. Um, and I will wish everybody, like I said, a happy weekend. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye.